Harry runs into Commander Riker. Harry hates his teacher and he hates calculus. And Harry joins Unit B375, even though he's not an artist. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The <laughs> Harry Show with Ciroc Lofton. And, and yeah, that's Crosby. a lot of Harry. <laughs> totally. That's a whole lot of Harry in the intro. <laughs> uh, my name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're uh, doing a review of Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 1, Episode 16, entitled When the Bow Breaks, written by Hannah Louise Shearer and directed by Kim Manners. This was February 13th, 1988, and this entire season is sponsored by our good pal, Grandpa One, a.k.a. Tim Baum. There it is. How are you guys Salute. doing today? Good. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Pretty good. Doing good. As long yeah, as I'm Harry's happy. doing well, we're happy, right? How's Harry? Harry. <laughs> Harry? Harry's Harry these days. He's a man now. <laughs> yep. He's, he's yeah. a man. We should Making follow dolphins. up on him and see if he became a, an artist, an oceanographer, a mathematician. Right. Yeah. A dolphin. Yeah. Maybe right. became a dolphin. Yeah. A <laughs> works at the aquarium. You know, you never know. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But that was a cool episode. I actually enjoyed this episode. I felt yeah, I, I felt like it it was just fun to watch. I thought the storyline was interesting enough for me. I was curious. I didn't know where it was going to go, so that kind of left me like, okay, where is this going to go? Kept me curious and watching. Um and I thought the performances were great, especially by the kids uh, led yeah. by uh, Wesley in this case. I thought he did a fantastic job and showed a lot of other sides to his personality that I didn't uh, pick up before. Yeah. Yeah. He was so wonderful with the kids, you know, and and you you really you really got um, a comforting sense that he 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 was on top of it and he really cared for the well-being of these children. Um, and that, you know, that interaction with the little Alex Alexandra, I think yeah. the, mm -hmm. it's just absolutely, you know, precious with him. And you really see him being the leader that we know he will eventually obviously become. And it was just so touching. I really loved the themes in this, um, you know, the 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 theme of um, you know climate change and global warming and the ozone layer, how how you know foreboding that is, you know, and how topical, and and the use of technology, how technology got the best of them, yeah, and they have to sort of redefine their use of technology so that they use it in a positive way instead of a negative way. I mean, these two elements are so current to our lives right now. These are like these, these monumental themes going on right now in our lives. And totally. so it, it, was, it was a really wonderful um, uh, surprise for me to see that, that you know, that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. It look, it, it, those are the really under the, the root themes of this episode obviously the children is the event you know but the themes of this um episode which is what we want star trek you know to be capable of doing and and it, and it really delivered in this episode mm -hmm. yeah if i remember correctly uh talk of ozone layer and all that kind of stuff really started only in in like the late 80s mid or late 80s and so it but it feels like Star Trek, again, being so far ahead of the, their time, they took that and used that as the theme, you know, where that's that's ruining their health, that's making them sterile or whatever. Uh, right. the, the, and that that theme of be, becoming dependent on technology and not even really knowing how it works. The scientists don't even know how it works. They just go, you know, the scientists are kind of stopped sciencing. You know, they kind of just get reliant on this technology that's also harming them. You know, it's make it. It was just a, a really ahead of their time kind of theme that I really appreciated. God, yes. I mean, it's like, you know, we just go Google it. 
you know, just Google yeah, it. Totally. Look it up on Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. You know, what are the sources here? What is this? You know, is this is we we're not like using our full capabilities of research and 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 um, you know what it what it would mean to to. I mean, I remember as a kid having to go to a library to get research. You know, go through stacks of books and 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 figure out how to how to access this stuff. Sure, it's made things a lot easier, but at what cost? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, really great because they use the kids as a way to raise the stakes. And as soon as they took the kids, I was like, "Oh, this is war!" <laughs> like you know, I, I was like, there's, <laughs> there, you can't. There's no going back from this, right? They're not gonna. Say all right, well, we can't figure this out. Let's leave. There, this is it. This right. is like a, a red line moment. So it really raised the stakes for me. Thought it was a great tool. But going back to what you said about the themes, uh, Denise, I agree that these themes were uh, well thought out and um, well presented. Um, one of the things that the Aldanians didn't want to do was investigate its own source of power its own its own real truth it was avoiding looking in that direction and i thought that was another kind of interesting thing that the writers brought into the mix because it was it was a character flaw to try to not engage you know the thing that you rely so heavily on that's just actually a part of you right. um and and ignoring it is not going to help help anything either so i think that was a, a nice little subtle way to talk about confronting you know things and not letting them just be off to the side absolutely i mean really uh, you're absolutely right i mean it, it can it can it can act as sort of a religious metaphor too you mm-hmm. know the the god source the source of all being you know that that where where all all we have to do the custodian the you know, custodian the, the, the custodian that 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 takes care of everything and all mm-hmm. and we just accept that that's just that's just in faith we don't need to know where the power source is, you know. Um, we we just accept it as all knowing, all being. So it, it it again, you know, these wonderful themes of of um in the in this episode was, re- and they were able to really really underline them in a in a in a really subtle way. You know, it wasn't like we've seen the past episodes where they drop this nugget in and then you know, don't do anything with it. They kind of followed through on these, you know, they took it to its, they, they, they came up with a cure um, or a, a strategy for, to, to deal with the ozone and the radiation, the shield can't be up uh, that, that will um, alleviate that issue. You know, they look at the source of the power. They look mm-hmm. at the custodian so- source and they decide um, we we have to relearn. We have to relearn everything now, which was a really wonderful, you know, step that so they they came, they they come to conclusions and answers in this episode. Yeah. The other thing I like was, uh, and I have to go back to Will Wheaton and mm-hmm. his performance in this. I think he really deserves a lot of kudos because this was the first time that I was anticipating and excited that he was going to save the day. I was like, I was like, okay, now you can save the day. Will this is the moment for you, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I'm right. totally, I'm totally cool with it. Like when he got to the computer and started asking questions, I thought that was a great scene for mm-hmm. him. You know, what, what is the power? You know, who are the progenitors? And you know, just being curious as a kid normally is, but those questions are helping us as the audience, you know, see how will um how uh his mind works, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Well, and he's the one who comes up with the strategy, you know, gets all the kids together and says, you know, this is what you know, we're basically going to strike. But mm-hmm. we all have to do it together. We all have to be on the same page and that's exactly what stopped everything and allowed, you know, for the others to come in. 
the one the one um you know question I scratch my head about with this is again um you know cap the captain sends the first officer and data down to the planet and I'm thinking you got to have some security here you you know you're at a hostile you're on a hostile um planet you know they're there this is a threat and no and they're not they don't have phasers yeah and i just thought you know it it just is a, such a glaring omission you know to not have security with them i i just don't understand it's like every time they go to an away team it, it, tasha or wharf or both or both yeah. Be there. yeah well, i could um, see i could see one or, or, stand, or, or i could see wharf call. being back on the on the ship i mean somebody be on the ship in right. that capacity but if they're going you know that's why it's great you have two of us yeah in perfect. that you know so one can stay on the ship but one has got to go down it's perfect the, to have them both but then you got to use them <laughs> you got to use like, them well, yeah i'm just standing well, you know, there really getting hailing frequencies going you well know? i also feel like it, it could just be a conversation where the captain says uh tasha you know i i need i need too, and you you make the decision. You say, Worf, you stay back with me. Data, you. That's right. And yeah. they, just some yeah. kind of Absolutely. instructions. Yeah. Yeah. It, and you know, going back sense. to going back real quick to Wes, I had the same thoughts that you guys did, which was this was the first time that I think they did Will Wheaton a service rather than a disservice mm -hmm. by putting him in a position to where it makes sense. For him to save the day. It makes sense for him to be the leader. He's not a 16-year-old or 15-year-old on the bridge where he doesn't belong, saving the day when it doesn't make sense. He's mm -hmm. in a group of children where he's by far the oldest and likely the smartest. And obviously, this is the right situation in, in, to, to where the viewer looks and says, yes, this is Wesley Crusher's time to shine. Time. He's not going to turn to Katie and be like, well, what do you think we should do, Katie? On the on the bridge, we just have the youngest person figure it out. So what you know, what do you think? You know, he <laughs> it, it totally made sense. And they really helped him out so much more by giving him this kind of story to where, yeah, that's what we want to see in that. And it and it works. And they didn't yeah. it none of it felt forced. It all it all fit perfectly. And I was really happy that they found that angle you know yeah. or that that fit for him because i feel like that's a much better fit plus i thought it was really cool that we could be reminded that this is a family ship their kids their parents you know there are other things there are a thousand people on this ship I, and, and i got a real sense of family watching mm -hmm. this episode it really felt like uh oh this is a family show of space mm -hmm. and i enjoyed that um again will wheaton the sensitivity he had working with the other kids. Not every kid is good with other kids, um, but he had a softness, gentleness to him. Uh, the way he picked up that little girl and kind of Good held point. her like, you know, um, this is my little sister type of yeah. a hug. I thought that was just, those are subtle things that shows that Will Wheaton, the man, the person is a good guy and he's really good with kids. And it translated very well in, in, in this episode. I was going to say this speaks to who Will is mm -hmm. as a person. Um, you know, we have, I, I have the privilege of knowing him, you know, behind the scenes, not just watching him on this uh, show. But, you know, he has um, that graciousness with with people and with kids and you know, you certainly saw it in his performance in Stand by Me, which he had done oh, yeah. you know, just before this. That group of kids, that that pack that they made, and the 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 beauty and of that film, how they all work together. And this was like sort of the first time on the show in the in in the series that we're seeing Will with other kids. You know, he's always with the adults. And so you you get now another aspect 
of his character, not only as Wesley, but you see something about him as a person, how mm-hmm. his, his, his heart is, his caring nature, his um, availability, his, his speaking on, on, you know, one-on-one in a, in a, in a, at a level. And of course he's, he's got brothers and sisters. So he, mm-hmm. you know, understands this dynamic, but it, it's, it was, it was just beautiful. The right note he hit each each scene just the perfect note you know that makes me think that and i just thought of this that's i feel like that may have been what was missing for uh wesley crusher the character was a friend was a peer uh because they they gave srock they gave you that gift with jake and nog on deep space nine but Mm -hmm. will never had that so he was always the kid amongst right. the adults and you see how he shines as the kid amongst kids what right. if rather than forcing him onto the bridge constantly in these weird things what if they just gave him like storylines in the school you know the, the the ship school or with his best friend where they get into trouble or they work on a science project together or his girlfriend or any anything like that then it, it would have put him in an element that was much more natural and yeah it would have been it, those great stories could have come out of that you got a taste of it, you know, for a brief moment, I think in the episode Justice. Remember yep. when they're playing, right. all the kids are running and he steps accidentally on the grass. But you got you got this wonderful sense of these kids being age appropriate, like their peers, they're hanging with each other, they're playing games, they're, you know, kind of excited you know about each other and the new the new guy and the girl girls he doesn't know if he's she's flirting and all those wonderful lovely things of youth you know of, of, of childhood you get to experience and yeah you're you're absolutely right Ryan that would have that would have been such a different um uh or, element for- or a sibling uh, a, a younger brother or sister yeah. and then you just get much more of that story and that dynamic right I, I I would say that you don't necessarily need a, a person his age or a sibling per se. What I would have done is I would have taken this episode mm-hmm. and placed it earlier in the Wesley storyline before he starts saving the day on the ships. Let this kind of story build his character, mm-hmm. show that he that he, you know, show him being a leader amongst the kids. And that earning his reputation to be invited on the bridge and have that kind of uh, caveat. I also think that when you have uh, at the end of this, it could have they could have used this as an opportunity to tell Picard, the Aldanians, to tell Picard what each kid's special gift was. And it could have also have been ex- explained to Picard that Wesley is a specially gifted kid with leadership skills or whatnot. Then before the traveler, him, mm-hmm. before the traveler, then we Pretty see good. him get invited on the bridge because Picard has learned from the Aldanians that Wesley is special and that he has these gifts that they are able to tune into because of their devices or whatnot. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that would elevate him going forward as being the ensign and this and that, and because they put faith in him because they've seen him perform in this particular instance, mm-hmm. saving these kids in hostage situation. Great point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. All well, just, you know, subtle. Subtle thing. change. Yeah. Changes yeah. That, that reveals so the much. Hero, the too grandiose of a hero too <clears throat> early. Without mm-hmm. giving him some nice little, you know, steps sure. to climb up, look, yeah. and without yeah. giving yeah. the audience those steps to to right. see, you know, show right. don't tell. Let let's see him right. demonstrate his skills and his intelligence and his leadership, so that having him on the bridge is we can swallow that a lot more easily because we say, oh yeah, we saw him. He's a valuable right. member of the crew in his own way. Yeah, if it wasn't for him, those kids wouldn't have gotten back to those parents. And, you know, and still be making owe, dolphins. Yeah, we owe him <laughs> something, you know, and he's proven himself when we, in the episode Justice, you know, let that follow. And then you get to the point where he's the, you know, the ship savior because he's been identified 
already by alien races, by his own peers, mm -hmm. as being and by accepted. his actions and by his right. actions, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great point. But he did a great job in this episode. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, and I want to say there's the thing that uh, Will Wheaton does, which is really great as an actor. When he's being told something in a scene, uh, when he got on the ship, for example, the, the Aldanians, you know, brought him on and they were instructing him that he was going to be the leader and it was, he was in charge. He does this thing where he registers the information. And he does it in an eye movement. It's a very kind of looking back into his mm -hmm. own eye kind of movement. And it's exceptional. It's really great. It means that he's processing what they're saying. It also means that he has doubt. He really, he really registers the doubt in his, head, in his facial expressions. But it's a very subtle eye movement. And I've mm -hmm. seen him do it several times. And it's always on the close up, but he does this thing where it's like a almost like when you swallow your food, it's his eyes swallowing the information. Yeah, and right. I think it's, I think it's a great uh, uh, skill that he has as an actor. It's mm -hmm. a really good observation. I also noticed it in his tone of voice when he starts the next sentence after registering. Right, his face tells us what his mind is going through. And then he'll go, well, and kind of like lean into, you know, like, like I'm, he's that tone of voice is telling you, I'm unsure about this thing, but I'm going to go through with it or whatever it is. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good point. I mean, and like Denise, you're saying with Stand By Me, clearly this kid was a good actor at a young age. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's great that they're giving him that opportunity to show that, especially like in what Srock said in close ups. Because uh, he's he's got interesting reactions and interesting, you know, facial movements, uh, which is not always the case with kid actors. <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, you know, again, this is this is an odd can be an odd tone. I mean, Stand By Me is a very naturalistic, you know, kids doing what kids would do. This is nothing like what you can even compare anything to. I mean, you know, this, he's he's this uh, technological space futuristic genius boy wonder in a, on a spaceship. You know, it's like, uh huh, okay, <laughs> and, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I know how to play that. Um, it, you know, it just it, it it it's really impressive, and and you know, again, I, I just I I just had such wonderful. Um, moments with with Will throughout mm. this this first season, and you know, I I just always adored him, and I loved being with him whenever I could. I would visit him in his uh, classroom that he just tricked out beyond belief. You know, <laughs> really, so, creative, so yeah. imaginative, and um, you know, we always we always just, and, and still do, we just adore each other. So it's, it's all good. I'm, I was really, you know, again, I didn't really remember this um, episode and I, I wasn't in these scenes with him, but so it was just really fun to, um, to see him be, be just so right. And so on spot on this one. I want to hear more about how he tricked out his classroom, but we've got to oh. take a quick break, everybody. <laughs> Maybe if oh. Denise remembers any of that, she'll tell us on the other side. Also, some people did a little bit of investigative work on you, Denise, on some of your attire. We'll uh, talk about that on the other side. Mm. Uh, My, in real life? My real yep. life attire? Mm-hmm. Wow, oh, wow, we're getting uh, personal, are we? I know. Here, here <laughs> comes everybody. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with superstars Denise Crosby and Sirach Lofton. <laughs> Oh, oh, go That's on. Oh, Ryan, really? Uh, so here are the uh, trivioids of the week, everybody. There's some good ones. It's all Harry all the time. That's kind of like oh, a good line. Uh, <laughs> Harry runs into Commander Riker. Harry hates his teacher and he hates calculus. Harry joins Unit B-375, even though he's not an artist. Aldea is like the lost city of Atlantis. Aldeans carry flowers in cornucopias. 
Uh, <laughs> humans are unusually attached to their offspring. The custodian is a computer built by the progenitors. Humans are a stubborn people. Harry sculpts a dolphin, and Harry's dad is an oceanographer. Lastly, Alexandra's favorite toy is a wig with a tail. I don't know if you guys, that was... <laughs> wig. That's six. Yeah. yeah. What the heck? It was a wig uh, with I a... I thought that was a, a triple. So did I, but then yeah. it... It, it, yeah. it looked like a cheap, a cheap triple. It looked like somebody shaved a triple and then just like kept the hair. <laughs> uh, so what we teased, Denise... Apparently, uh, some of our fans were asking about the necklace that you wear seemingly every show. And so our Dr. Susan V. Gruner sent in that she believes it is something called the LeVar. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe we're wrong here, but it does look just like it. Check it out here. Yes, LeVar has his own version. Oh, Mine his is own different. version. Mine is different. This is called the Lavar. So this is What's this yours? is called, mine is the La Loop. That's the company that makes it. Brent has one. I have one, and Lavar ha has one. Really? I, I, yeah, I have mine completely separate and apart from from them. I had no idea that they had one until we we all were at a con and we we all were wearing ours. And I guess Lavar got in touch. I, I don't know how it went down, but he he has his own signature line. It is kind of like it's it's mine is a very rounded circle. His is a more flat flat mm -hmm. circle, but it mm -hmm. is on a leather um, thing. I also have a pearl uh, a pearl one um, mm. that I wear sometimes. Well, too. what's really cool about it is it's also handy in that. Mm. You can hang your sunglasses on it. That's the point of it. Or your glass. I mean, it's and it looks yeah. cool. This is There's... this is um this is why I wear it. You know. Oh yeah. See, that's more of a a, a rectangular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see, with Lavars, it's it's yeah. This is what you do, and this is why I got Brilliant. it. Because um, I was constantly needing my reading glasses, and I would I was losing them all the time. You know, I'd leave them, I'd leave them on the shelf yeah. or the store or, you know, walk away without. That's you know. the number one so. thing. When I used to work in restaurants, the number one thing people leave behind are sunglasses. Our lost and found was just boxes of sunglasses and a couple credit cards, yeah. but people come back for those. I could have bought a yeah. second home on the money I've, you know, spent on lost <laughs> sunglasses. Believe me. Wow. So I just, I just said, I'm done. I, and this, this, so yeah, this is genius, genius. Mm -hmm. This episode, by the way, is sponsored by La Loop, hopefully, <laughs> um, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> uh, but, Denise, do you remember anything specific about uh, Will Wheaton's classroom? Classroom. So <clears throat> he had a, you know, a separate trailer. You know, he had to spend X amount of time in school, as you know. Um, so he just he just put tons of, like, white little you know fairy lights all over and hung all kinds of strange posters I'm, i can't remember any specific posters but it was just it was just sort of this like magical space that was that was just colorful and um artistic and it just it, it had nothing to do with like a sterile classroom. He just, he just would, whatever he would find, he would, he would just mm. kind of trick it out. And it was just <laughs> so fun to go into, you know, it made, it, which I'm sure, you know, was the point he would, he had to spend X amount of time in there. So he was going to make it, you know, as fun and creative uh, as possible. So, you know, I would find myself ending up hanging out in Will's, you know, classroom. Who wouldn't? Time. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and we we sort of took our cue from him in that I, I think I told you once we we went into the prop department at Paramount, yeah. and got a bunch of props and started Flamingos. decorating our little our little, yeah, our little um trailer village, you know, and just just tried to make it really fun and and whimsical and and creative and then you know somebody got angry and made us take it all down oh why, what no why wasn't hurting anybody certainly it's I probably it was, patrick 
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> this is not. This is not a trailer park. <laughs> this is a serious Re- studio. Yeah. <laughs> Starfleet regulation six point five seven. <laughs> so, Rock, before we get back to the episode, do you you had to probably be in 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 school, uh, right, when you were working on Deep Space yeah. Nine? Did you do anything with your classroom? Do you remember, or was it just Starfleet regulations? Yeah, I was a boring. I guess I was boring. I didn't. I didn't deck out my trailer. Um, you probably had I, a much nicer trailer. Uh, probably at that time, yeah, because yeah. it was now years after you guys had started. So yeah. Yeah. I remember that when I did get my trailer, the first season they told me that it was Whoopi Goldberg's old trailer. So I was happy with that. Oh, yeah. You know that had to be nice. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is good, <laughs> sailor. This is good yeah. luck. That's really good luck. Absolutely. Um, so I'd never decorated in my classroom. Um, and most of the time, I tried to get out of the classroom. That was the whole. That seems more. I was able to negotiate with my teacher <laughs> that PE was a necessity. <laughs> So you had to go play. So you went and played basketball. Yeah. You're yeah. like, I got to do an hour nice. of basketball and 35 yeah. minutes of math. That's just how yeah. things nice. work. It's, it's I you know, it's part of the curriculum. Brilliant. I wonder if you had the same teacher as Will. Um, I had a, a teacher named Sydney. Um, a man? Sydney, a man, yes. A man, yeah. Uh, no, Will. Uh, I think. An, an older man named Sydney. And then... After Sydney was a guy named Pat Jackson, another guy, and he was he was my favorite teacher, Pat Jackson. I used to I used to call him Pat Jackson, studio teacher, and it was kind of like a <laughs> pet detective type of yeah, thing. But yeah. Pat Sounds Jackson, like studio it. teacher, yeah, yeah, dun, dun, right. dun. <laughs> exactly. You should Pat pitch Jackson. that. You got to yeah. pitch that story. <laughs> Actually, that's a that, good one. That could yeah. be a series. Like, that's a absolutely. show right there. Yeah. Um, all right but yeah i had a, I had a lot of fun and, and do you remember denise when they did this episode if, if you saw a lot of kids hanging around because usually when there were classrooms full of kids it was a known thing because there would have to be now eight of us in that classroom right that's right um yeah i think I think, yeah, kind of, you know, just because they were wearing such cute little outfits. Yeah. It was adorable little, you know, space yeah. ensembles that they, they yeah. had on. Um, yeah. I kind of seemed, but, but you know, again, I, I wasn't in any of those scenes with them, so I didn't get to act with them. But, um, yeah, yeah I, I remember them being being around. Yeah, definitely. I thought it was really cute, too, when um, Wesley is holding the girl's hand and he walks her into the bridge at the end. And he yeah. says, she wants to say thank you. I, I you know, they, they also the card was such a mess. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, what am I yeah. going to do with this thing? I know. I, I was hoping that when, you know, he did eventually pick her up when he was still visiting on Aldea, Aldea um, that he would have come back into the meeting room with her still in his arms. Oh my God. Yeah. That would have with, melted with people. All, yeah. yeah. He know, didn't though. No, he, didn't. he, he couldn't. He, Cause I thought that would have been a really great character moment, you know? Um, and, and he of course then would have played the end moment quite differently. You would have to, when she comes back in, you know, to give, to say thank you and bring those flowers you what are so right. Can you imagine if if after that she comes in to give the flowers and Picard kind of kneels down and melts and he has like this special moment with her and it's like everybody kind of disappears to him and he's just talking yes. to her, thank you, Katie, yes. or whatever it was. And then she leaves. And then the funny moment is he turned around and he goes, oh, <clears throat> or, you know, and he gets back, he fixes up. He's like, okay, back to, and everybody's like, <laughs> you know, that's a different funny moment, but it's adorable you're right exactly yeah. exactly it would have, it would have been a really nice way to play that and he played a lot of beats though what he played a lot of the awkward moment beats though in this where he would just mm-hmm. like uh you know 
I'm not very good with children. And then Picard's face is like, neither am I. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I did like the facial expressions. He, he gave those a few times. Where, oh. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to say, we also did, by the way, everybody, have a special guest star in this episode. Uh, there was one of the uh, kids' names was Rose. Let me look that up. Yep, Rose. And it was played by one Mackenzie Westmore. Mm. I'm not entirely sure which one it was. Maybe it's this one. Uh, tough to tell. Uh, 35 years later, but Mackenzie <laughs> Westmore, Michael Westmore's daughter, uh, actually was in this uh, this episode, and she played one of the kids for a moment there. Also, did you guys notice the guy that played Radu? He has the most recognizable face. I'm like, I've seen this guy 50 yeah, seen times, guy. and mm -hmm. I have no idea when or where. So just now I was looking him up his name is jerry harden and i'm sure there are a lot of people in the live chat yelling at me saying obviously that's the guy from fill in the blank but uh probably where i recognize him from is a couple of other episodes of the next generation uh where he plays samuel clemens who everybody mm. knows, right and uh and that was in seasons five and six times arrow um so he plays Mark Twain with, a, which is a very good Guinan and Picard uh, two-part episode. It's a very famous one, and he also played in Star Trek Voyager. He played Doctor Naria. Um, I don't remember what character that hmm. was, but it was a, a first season episode called Emanations. Um, so that's probably why I recognize him so much. But he's got you know an extensive uh imdb page of course with things like the golden girls maybe i've seen him in that uh, and other things but anyway I, I just he's one of those guys where it's like as soon as he comes on screen you're like okay this guy i've seen him 50 times and i don't know where you know right um the 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 woman that played um the adoptive mother of harry mm -hmm. um i i was so surprised she, i her name is lisa I forget her last name. She, she, we were in acting class together forever. Really? Yeah. I, I, I had forgotten completely that she did this episode. Trying to think. Uh, was it, it well, but we, we don't remember what the character's name was. I don't remember the no. character. I don't know if they they ever. Rochella, maybe it was Rochella. Wasn't Rochella? Maybe it was Duana Ivy Bethune. No. Or Michelle Marsh. Hmm. No. Yeah, it's Michelle tough. Marsh. Hmm. Michelle. Yeah, was I don't know if we. I don't know if we got. Her name, the character. I don't know if we yeah, got the character's I did, name. I, I, I don't think so because I wanted to write it down to scroll it. What oh, bummer! I but know. you were in acting class with her, huh? Michelle Marsh. That name is familiar too. Michelle Marsh. Who does she play in the show? Uh, Leda, Leda, L E D A. Michelle Marsh. Oh, I'll pull up her picture here. Too. Let me let me see. That's gonna this make is, me. This is Michelle yeah. Marsh. No, no, no. The mystery. Gosh, I know. Thirty-five years can do a lot to us. Oh, <laughs> we know we uh, I've seen her so vividly in class too. Maybe one of the one of the group will. We'll know what I'm talking but about. But it's not Rochella played by Brenda Strong, right? No, no. Brenda, I know as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But oh, this would Lisa something. Lisa. Oh, goodness gracious. There was a uh, Laureen. Mind is a terrible thing, isn't it? Laureen Mendel. <laughs> there was a, a Susan Duchot. There was an Amy Wheaton. Oh, Wheaton's. Wait a minute. Is that Will Wheaton's 
Yeah. Oh, Brother yeah. and sister, Amy Wheaton and Jeremy Wheaton, they were also they actually. Gotta be. Yeah. Gotta oh, that's be. amazing. Yes. Right? So, way to pick fun. that up. Wow. <laughs> we would have missed Good that. Sign. Yeah. yeah. I didn't notice otherwise. So they had Will Wheaton's brother and sister. They had Michael Westmore's daughter. They're just like, all right. Who's got kids? We need yeah. anybody got kids? So with kids. That's yeah. essentially what it was. It was bring, it was in, bring yeah. your kid to de- uh, to work. <laughs> and they get a paycheck this time. And, and they get, get a, paycheck a paycheck for it. Yeah. 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 They're not dumb. Wow. That's that cool. was smart. So uh, so no wonder Will was so good with the kids. Half of them were his brothers. <laughs> Their brothers that's so funny. It's like home. Just yeah. like home. Just like <laughs> Well, that um, reminds me, you guys, it's just about time for the home run of the episode. Thanks to Carrie Schwent for hooking that up, that cool baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think, Denise? Who gets the home run of the episode now that baseball season has officially begun? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, well, I think for real, it's Will Wheaton in this uh, episode. He just brings um such warmth and expertise and a level of of of, you know just performance level that we haven't um you know we've been wanting we've been just craving he just plays everything perfectly the notes we see we see a depth in his in his person um it's appropriate everything he's doing and and the way he's behaving and acting and um he just hits it out of the the ballpark Mm -hmm. it's a tater what about you uh siroc (laughs) i agree 100 percent with denise on this one uh will was uh exceptional in this episode he really shined um i believe that he was Somebody that gave me some kind of comfort, knowing that he was the person kind of watching over the kids. I felt at ease that he was, you know, monitoring the situation, you know, show me what's happening with this kid, with that kid. Um, And he brought a lot of tension down for me because that I felt safe that the kids were in good hands. And I like that about him. there was a moment when one of the parents says, the last time I saw him, I yelled at him. <laughs> and that reminds me of anybody who has a loved one and they are, yeah. um, they, they're they about to lose them or they lost them. And they remember the last time that they talked to him. It's always the most. It's like, wow, the last time I was, you know, saw that person. And you never wanted it to end on a, a sad note or a bad note, like an argument or a fight. And I could sense the grief in that parent when he when he said, you know, the last time I saw him, I yelled at him, you know, felt like that's not how I wanted to be of the last note. And um, that's why I really appreciated uh, Wesley being a guardian, being like the chaperone and saying, I'm going to make sure all the kids are fine. I'm going to check in. I'm going to tune in with them and ask them how they're feeling and really get to know them. And so I thought that's what really uh, made him stand out in this episode. Uh, also really loved the scene when he started to get the gang of kids together to revolt and protest. When he goes to wake up that little girl who might be Michael Westmore's daughter, but <laughs> th- when she wakes up, she snatches up and looks. And I thought, boy, that's great acting even for an adult, the way she woke up. I thought the that. same. Yeah. Uh, and then and she really was like, you know, terrified. And, and I thought, that is great. And so the kids really, in general, all the kids did a great job. But Wesley was uh, just really a shining, uh, mm-hmm. a shining in this episode. Great points mm-hmm. about uh, always looking back at the last thing we said and always reminding ourselves that that's always a possibility. So always mm-hmm. make sure that the last thing you say is at the very least lukewarm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even if- right. You know, um, so uh, my home run of the day uh, was just going to be the kids in general because, uh, you know, they did fine. And, and you know, I'm usually a tough critic on kid actors, you know, 
And Star Trek tends to do a good job with kid actors. Uh, Sorak is a shining example of that. <laughs> but uh, also, secondarily, I'd like to uh, give the home run of the day to Hannah Louise Shearer for writing this and mm. uh, Kim Manners for directing this because they Hannah wrote this in a way for the kids to work. You know, if if she gave too much techno babble or too many things that make us go, no, there's no way a 16 year old can do that. You know, she gave us a script that works with kids. And clearly the director, uh, Kim, is going to have to work with these kids and know how to work with these kids. And she obviously did a great job. So both of them, I think, set these kids up to succeed. Uh, so big shout out to them um, there. Kim, Kim is a man. Oh, Kim is a man. Oh, Kim Manners. Okay. <laughs> I <had a> guess. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, uh, big kudos to him for putting the kid for being able to communicate with the kids mm -hmm. in a way that uh, yeah. makes them shine rather than makes me roll my eyes because uh, I'm yeah. I roll my eyes a lot. So that's it. Uh, let's give a special thanks to. Did Kim work uh, other episodes? I believe so. I yes, okay. I, I do believe so. Good. Thanks for correcting me. I'll check that out. Um, okay, so yeah, we didn't like have any give... female directors. Yeah, mm -hmm. only writers, it seems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a uh, very special thanks to our friends. Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Arukin. Nice. That sounded more like Blanca. Titus <laughs> Muller, Darlena Marie, uh, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, D.Q., Neil Akasaka. Our pal Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, my live from Tokyo, the Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Jed Thompson, Steve Case. <laughs> I can never get this right. Steve Case, aka Joe Bugbuster. And of course, <laughs> Dr. Susan V. Gruner, who's actually a bug lover, coincidentally, and Jason Oaken. He doesn't care about bugs one way or the other. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Everybody stick around. Uh, we're going to hit the uh, free for all right now. We'll be right back on the seventh rule. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the seventh rule. This is the free for all. Melissa Longo is here, as is Homer Frizzell, a.k.a. Tom Selleck. Uh, Allison Leach Hyde <laughs> is here. <laughs> Stephanie Baker with a Mike Goo cameo. We've got Ooh. oh Kerbin today. Uh, the Dark Lord Kerbin joining us. Mai is live in Tokyo. Tierney C. Diekman is back finally wearing cool colors. Uh, Steve Case, a.k.a. Joe Bugbuster, is here. <laughs> What's up? Uh, Carrie Schwent is also here on a post and the Matt Boardman. First things first. Jake Sisko guesses the IMDb score. Ooh. Mm. Uh, I like this episode. I'm going to say um, 7.6. Hmm. Anybody 7. else have any guesses that... Uh, Eve England said she couldn't make it today. She sent us an email saying that she liked it because she liked... Uh, that it showed the kids and it showed that there's family on the ship and it was really nice. She said she'd give it a 10. She didn't say 10, ah. but it was something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but she did say good things about it. Anybody else have any uh, guesses? I would have thought lower than 10. <laughs> Maybe 6.6, 6.7. Yeah. I'm going to go 6.8. All right. The answer is 6.4. No. What's going on? <laughs> That's not nice when we've got Jerry Burton here. I mean, come on. Yeah. Rude. Um, 
So uh, I guess Steve Case was right. Lower than 10. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, would you like to please start us off and tell us your thoughts on this episode? Yeah, uh, I actually like the overall premise of this episode. Um, there, There's a couple of messages that I got from watching this. Uh, one is of conservation. They seem to be fully aware of pushing like, you know, a, a message of conservation, which I love. Um, but also one th is that complacency can be a dangerous thing. And, um, and technology can be a useful tool, but we probably shouldn't surrender all of our power to it. So we, we need to figure out a way to balance, you know, the, our relationship with technology and, and, and not letting it dull our wits and because we need, we need struggles and challenges to, um, to grow and learn and, and all of that stuff, which is why Harry needs to take calculus. He needs to, he needs that experience. He needs that <laughs> challenge to push him forward um, with calculus, even though he wants to be an artist. So uh, that's what, that's the overall thing that I got. One of my favorite moments in the whole episode was the very end when Alexandra <laughs> leaves the little pup ball on Picard's back. <laughs> and I read that Vanessa, one of the twins that played Alexandra, improvised that moment and they kept it in. Oh, um, that wasn't in the script. And yeah, so it, it gave me a chuckle. And um, yeah. Those were my thoughts. And oh, and visually, there's a lot of visuals that I really enjoyed in this episode, too. Uh, the power source part when they were walking in looked pretty cool to me. And then um, the images at the corridors kind of looked cool to me, too. Spacey. <laughs> you know? So. Yeah, the brilliant thoughts. twin actors that uh, played mm -hmm. Alexandra, Jessica Bova and Vanessa Bova. Uh, good knowledge there. What about you, Homer Freezy, out somewhere in New Yeezy? Your thoughts on this episode? Yes. Um, I echo what Melissa said. And then I've been in touch with Anne-Marie as well. And so I have references to children of folks that are involved in Star Trek. Mm -hmm. uh, Rose, of course, played by Michael Westmore's daughter, Mackenzie. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there were two of Will Wheaton's, um, like a brother and sister, mm -hmm. I think, that mm -hmm. were in there. Mm -hmm. And then there's someone who was in Fiddler on the Roof, um, who was one of the main actors, one of the the parents. Uh, Michelle Marsh, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, beyond that, I've, I've just, I've got this image here, and I, I have to think that perhaps Picard and Beverly should be fitted with glasses because that seems very close to me. Um, so it's it's a concern. I was told, don't sit too close to the TV. And I think maybe they got complacent in the future, and I'm worried about them. Very good. Yep. You'll be yeah. here all week, everybody. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Great stuff, Homer. Uh, well, Allison. It's, stuff. it's stuff anyway. Allison Leach Hyde is here. It looks like is that a uh, is that a uh, yeah that that's an Abyssinian kiosk creation. Looks like beautiful. Yes. What do you think of this episode? I like it. You know, it's pretty classic Trek. Reminds me a lot, weirdly, of Spock's brain because I just watched that episode. And there's a computer that's running everyone's technology for millions of years, and it's all going downhill because I forgot how to fix it. So it's classic trick um i really liked will wheaton's acting with all the kids thought he did a great job of it looked like they were all comfortable together and especially him with the twins <laughs> for alexandra they had some nice little moments which was nice to see but i think my favorite moment was uh katie when she was playing the the instrument with her group member i don't pod there we go pod um that music was the traveler's music that the sad song oh plays. is that I right? really like that they, they brought that back because it was a nice theme 
Good knowledge. Mm. Nice to hear it again. So, Did they play that yeah. same theme at the end? Because I thought it was the same song, but I didn't actually check. That I don't know. So. And the cool thing, one one more little thing about um, the the power core at the end, it was just a model that Akuda made uh, with Ooh. toy parts and tank model kit bits and part of i have to look at this otherwise i'm going to get it wrong the from the motion picture the bottom of the space dock model to make oh. that with a oh. acrylic tube that they put a light up <laughs> and made it colorful so i thought that was a cool way of not spending too much money and getting a really cool effect that's probably why they love the akudas yeah. and doug drexler was because they made stuff out of like you know tire irons and waffles <laughs> they're like macgyvers, the MacGyvers. out there yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good stuff allison thanks uh stephanie baker what is up dr stephanie baker that is of course uh your thoughts on this episode hi well first of all i'm wearing a voyager t-shirt it's the voyager and i have <laughs> behind me i'm in mike goo's uh trek star trek room um, I have always liked this episode because I think because it has such TOS vibes and uh, Will, uh, Wesley has like a positive role as, as opposed to being told to shut up. Um, but watching it recently, uh, I've always been a little creeped out by the Aldeans and they say we mean you no harm, but they really do mean harm. And um, this uh uh, episode to me is an allegory to um, institutions like the Indian boarding schools here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. When the government, along with religious institutions like the Catholic Church, took children, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes involuntarily from their homes and raised them in boarding schools. Um, mm -hmm. And they would they thought that they were doing the right thing. Um, and but they were causing harm and trauma. and. <clears throat> Uh, I know about this because that happened to my father. Um, other countries did this as well, such as Canada had their residential schools and Australia did it too with um, schools for the Aboriginal children. But um, despite that, I do like this episode. Um, I'm a little discreet. Like I said, it's hard to watch that that main Aldean, you know, say we mean no harm. And I think he might even believe it. Um, and then in the end, one of when the the scenes that I really like is actually when the enterprise goes spinning when it's pushed away. I thought that's a really cool effect that holds uh, really well. Great stuff. Also, see mm -hmm. Chancellor Lorel behind you. Yes. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, looking wow, good. Look at that. Uh, the Dark Lord Chris McGee, also known as Kerbin is here what's up chris what'd you think of this one yeah, zoom played a little trick on me apparently uh for april Fools, <laughs> i guess um yeah i thought it was, was a fine episode uh i know it's another hey the aliens look exactly like humans episode again why isn't that the central story <laughs> to be fair the end universe explanation will come in season six so you know hold on for that it's in it's sort of an explanation anyway uh, it was great seeing Jerry Harden again. Um, sorry? I think it was just an echo. Okay. Uh, great seeing Jerry Harden. Um, of course, he's going to be coming back in a later season playing a another famous character. I will uh, not want to say any more about that. That'll be a surprise. And uh, also, he played a character in one of my favorite Voyager episodes, Emanations. Um, also, as uh, Allison noted, that uh, that final scene that music that that sounded you noted that as well ryan that it seems very similar to the travelers music and um of course uh malicia loves that scene the the track name for that song on the ron jones set here is actually called attack of the killer furball <laughs> Lovely little, little <laughs> <trivia on that. laughs> that's awesome great um i didn't catch any nams in this uh episode uh so that's like what three or four episodes in a row now there weren't any nams that's pretty yeah, uh, depriving amazing. us um finally it was hard to 
pick a good phrase or line of the episode in this one, but I, I think I landed on a decent one here. Uh, Troy's line of humans are unusually attached to their offspring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alrighty then. Yeah, it's unusual. <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. I'll save my other nitpicks for uh, things left unsaid. Yeah, great stuff. I also want to things left unsaid. Talk more about that Voyager episode because I we noted that, but I didn't remember the episodes. Well, and Stephanie right now is pissed. She's like, "You don't remember emanations?" Anyway, mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about that a little later. Carrie Schwent is here. She's never watched a Voyager episode in her life for some reason. Uh, but what do you think <laughs> of this episode? <laughs> I enjoy enjoy this episode as a huge X Files fan. It's always cool to see yeah. Jer Jerry Harden again. I'm a collect mental collector of voices, and he's got just another one of those fantastic voices I could listen to for hours. That dolphin sculpture that Harry makes. I love dolphins. I want that that little that little guy. It was whoever made that. It was beautiful. That just the color of the of the wood was beautiful and. Q has a little bit of a nitpick, but we'll save that. We'll save that one for for the for the thing things left on unsaid. The the scene with the handoff of the little meta the little tricorder bit between between Beverly and Will was just fantastic. And he's yeah. you know keeping up appearances with the thing while he's standing behind her scanning, and she has no idea. That whole scene just absolutely cracks me up. And. <laughs> A card with the little with the little girl just is completely melts your heart. And she's standing there with her arms up, and he's looking down at her like, "Wait, okay, fine, I'll pick you up," even though it's a little bit weird. But she was just the cutest thing ever. But I do have my lim limerick for for the episode that I will impart before I see the see the floor. A planet of peers people thought was a myth. To have more children is their fondest wish. Some of the ship's kids are taken. Aldea offers them compensation. Thanks to Beverly, the planet will flourish. Not as good as my one from the Binar episode, but... <laughs> no one's going to top that. <laughs> I know, that was genius. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff, Carrie. Uh, good knowledge on the X Files, by the way. Uh, Kim Manners apparently is a big X Files director mm. as well, so there's probably a connection mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Steve Case, aka Joe Bugbuster, is here. Welcome. Uh, how are you, and what are your thoughts on this episode? Oh, I'm good, thank you. Um, what a horrific beginning to this episode with all the children being stolen. Um, this is not like a feel good episode, at least not at the beginning. And like others have shared, it, it certainly was a reminder of some other horrible things that have happened right here on Earth. Um, I did recognize some of the, the guest stars like Carrie Harden, for example, that folks have been talking about. Strangely, I didn't remember the episode itself. Um, it just hadn't left that mark on me when I first saw it years ago. Um, I recognize some parts um like the girl playing that musical instrument and wesley being introduced to the computer but um the episode itself i didn't really remember it was kind of strange um the custodian that was built long ago by the progenitors arranged all of this but for some reason um we never actually see the custodian do anything other than basically introduce itself to Wesley. So that was a, a curious lack of a twist in in the episode, I guess. Um, but obviously a, another story of those who trusted their technology a little too much and became dependent on it and forgot how to repair it or question it. And um, But it was sure tied up with a, a nice bow at the end. Um, with the little girl bringing up her flower. And, and uh, we saw again that Captain Picard just, I think someone had mentioned on a previous episode about how he doesn't like children. I don't think he has a problem with children. He's just incredibly uncomfortable around them. So I thought it was 
too cute an ending in in several respects, but I'm glad I saw it again. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Tierney C. Diekman is hanging out and she wants to talk about this episode and we want to hear about it. Your thoughts? Oh, my. Um, Well, definitely beloved for Jerry Harden. I mean, he's a legend. Um, uh, X-Files, of course, Deep Throat. And uh, I'm a huge, huge X-Files fan. So anytime I see him in anything, X-Files, Star Trek, everything. And and of course, Denise's role in X-Files and, you know, <laughs> everything else you pop up in. You're another one. I hear your voice and I go, that's Denise Cross. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I've I've always particularly liked this because of him being in it. And um, there's something quite appealing about a fully concealed, isolated, hidden planet full of, you know, not many people and no children. And they're all super afraid of sunlight and don't know how to deal with it. Like, can I relate? But, you know, um, one thing that uh, that struck me with this that never really had before i guess i just didn't pay enough attention this could have been so much worse this whole situation i mean they threw the enterprise and then that threat your children will be grandparents are you kidding me do you know who you are screwing with do you know what you just did like and they are so lucky they got the diplomat captain Picard. So lucky that he is whom they encountered. Like the, Cisco would not have handled this the same way. This would or have Jane been way. Oh no. This would have been an all out yeah. event. Like I and it could have been handled in a very different way as well they have the technology to toss a starship light years away as well as many other things that they know that they've gathered and they need help i mean they have the ability to shield their entire planet which should have shut down their whole atmosphere they should be long dead but okay we'll we'll science that away but um it there could have been other options but uh, this is one of those I I like it for the vibes. I I like it for the the mystery. There's some sinister feelings, and yet you feel for the children getting this opportunity to express themselves in a way that you know we all have that thing in ourselves of well, what if I could have done what I was meant to do deep down in here? You know, we all have that feeling like there's something that we were meant to to do as opposed to seek out and learn and practice that it would just click with us immediately but um like well, melissa made a really great point about that of you need to learn calculus but you can still be an artist harry even though it's totally right to you know be a seven-year-old mad at doing calculus or whatever he is but um <laughs> you know so there are, there are good vibes and bad and and Wesley does a great job with what he needs to do in this. Like, again, another up and down episode. I kind of would have liked to see this later in the series when we had um, more uh, species of children on the ship. What would they have done with, say, Alexander? Like, things like that. Um, but uh, many things for, for things left on set. I, I like the episode, mainly for... For Jerry Harden, if I'm being if I'm being honest, his performance just every time I see him just makes me happy. Um and yeah, there's it is what it is. It's it is. We'll we'll leave we'll leave more um politically paralleled things for things left on set. And Jerry Harden, more Jerry Harden talk. Oh, My yeah is live in Tokyo, everybody, if you can believe that. How are you today, Mai? What's up? And what'd you think of this episode, by the way? I liked it. I liked it. It was an interesting, it was an interesting, but I'm, I'm clearly the only one that thought of uh, Van Halen when I read the title of it. And the cradle will rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But the, the the title, when the bow breaks, down will come baby, cradle and all, I mean, it reminded me immediately of, of, of Icarus. It, it seems like that's what they're talking about there. Um, you know, seek the sun, the wax melts, you tumble down to earth and you suffer. The Aldeans, they sought too lofty of goals, I think. When they went for their technology, they ended up nuking their nads. Um, and then when the bow broke, when the, the environment, the ozone layer broke, they fell. And, and this was the problem. Um, this is an interest. I, I looked up the 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 low, the um, Rockabye Baby when that when the, what how that came into things, and it was apparently written in the 1700s by uh, nascent Americans watching the indigenous Americans um, hang their babies' uh, cradles from the low branches of the trees, so to to, to for, for letting them hang out there, um, and then somehow they took that and they said, "Let's use the treetop." And if you're using the treetop again, Icarus, you're going to fall. The whole thing comes falling down. Um, so I think I think the message that this was that I got from this was just try to stay in touch with reality, a little seek a little balance there. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting about this is aldea in Spanish means village or pueblo, and the the architecture, the boxy square uh, architecture of the aldeans planet and the orange clay color looked very much like pueblo to me so i thought that was kind of an interesting tie in there as well cool. yeah good but stuff that's, that's a good point didn't notice that uh that kind of orangish yellowish color yeah. uh anna post is here with our youngest ensign how are you today anna and uh what do you think of this episode if you had time to watch it with all the baby work that you're doing <laughs> i did have time to watch it she sleep some and is very vocal right now but um i always like this episode i uh this is one of those 21st century references so i find it interesting that they talk about um <laughs> being able to fix the hole in the ozone that we had created in the 21st century and you know basically almost had the same issue of um wiping ourselves out um but we fixed it and and they've done enough with the ozone that holes are starting to close in certain places they're not as bad as they were um which is kind of funny seeing that now when it wasn't the case when this episode was writ written um also just any any time any society gives over to the computer, things go wrong. Like it happens, you know, land out. Lots of lots of, like a Trek theme is don't don't become so complacent. Like when when did they stop having people who could fix the computer? Or like was do they not have doctors? Is the computer running the medicine? And it was a catch twenty two, and that's why it couldn't figure out that it was itself that was killing them like i mm. just the little the little things of what the computer does and what other people do um and this always makes me wonder what those kids grow up to be because they were specifically plucked out said they were extra special and these are their talents these are the best people at these jobs when those kids grow up they're going to have this experience in their head. Do you think they followed that track or felt they had to follow that track? Or or did Harry decide he liked calculus and wanted to do math? Like, I wonder if they, because of this, felt pressured to actually follow that thing that they said they were best at as opposed to something else that they might want to pursue. Mm-hmm. But... Mm. Good stuff. Nice Captain Proton shirt, by the way. Yeah. Uh, the Matt Boardman is here, everybody. Thank goodness for that. Uh, your thoughts on this episode? <laughs> you know, I would just like to say I stand in solidarity with with uh, Harry there because, uh, you know, calculus and I uh, we had a <laughs> bit of a fight <laughs> twice when I was in college. And it won both times. I, I, I seriously, oh. I still walk with a limp today because of it. <laughs> um, but, but no, but for real, like after, you know, it, it was one of those things uh, as I got out of high school, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do with my life because, you know, I had going through high school, I always had this, you know, I grew up watching the NBA, had this, these dreams of, of playing in the NBA. And then I had to coach my 
varsity year, my senior year, who who showed me that maybe I that was not a viable option for me. So I thought maybe I'll, you know, I love Star Trek. So maybe I'll become a computer engineer. And as part of those computer engineering courses, you of course had to take calculus. And I think that my mis my mistake was trying to take it online because I didn't want to have to go into class. And yeah, I had to take the class twice. So that's how I ended up being an artist because I didn't have to know calculus for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um uh, I really, uh, I, I like this episode. It's cute. And, uh, and I, I think that it's, uh, it, when you become a parent, it kind of, those things, you, you know, you, you look at it from a different perspective than when I was growing up and watching it. And I, I mean, I can understand Crusher, you know, being upset the way that she was upset about the kids, what's going on with my son and, and being protective and, and, you know, Troy's line, while it may be a little bit of a, a throwaway you know humans are very attached it's like yeah you know i'm i'm my son's going to be 18 this year and i'm looking at that the, the days in which he's with me are fewer and fewer um before he goes off into the world and i'm like yeah you know what i actually do have i i, can, I understand that yeah we do we do have an attachment to our kids and um but i think that you know, I I look at like Harry's dad, and I you know I understand because like as his dad, he's like, look, I got I know things that you don't know, and I want you to be prepared for for life, and that's kind of how I'm feeling now as as my kid uh, gets older, or one of my kids gets older, but uh, and and you want to make sure that they're prepared, and so I I like the the idea that these kids were were special and neat and had had that attention drawn to them, and and of course the the hug at the end with with whatever the furball triple. That's always adorable to me, and that that always that always gets my you know my heart there. Um, so, but a fun episode, I absolutely love it, and uh, and another great Ron Jones score. I think Ryan, you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. so sorry. Any final thoughts, <laughs> Sirak and Denise? Oh wow. You know, I, I always love hanging out with you guys and, and listening to your observations and, and insightfulness. And um, but there's something there was one thing that that Anna made me kind of ponder, and that was about these kids. Um, there was the one scene when, when the young girl is with quite the older gentleman, the music scholar and she's channeling this instrument that really I left me uncomfortable and I was thinking you know these kids are being told what their specialness is and going to just experience that it's like they've been taken out of a holistic environment, you know, not to even sit, mention their own, of course, attachment to their own families, but made to kind of focus solely on this one skill, which of course, the great artists and minds have a wealth of different experiences that inform their mastery that that make them who they are you know so it's like this 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 torture almost that i kept thinking how long is she going to be sitting with this man all day every day and that's all she's going to do and that 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 will create her, her genius and what that will do is destroy her mm. because I have seen so often, you know, whether it's athletes or people, you know, that have uh, practiced instruments, been told to, you know, practice 10 hours a day, they often crack, you know, or they walk away from it completely, you know, with that kind of rigid um, sort of attention to one thing. So it it, it was sort of a... It's an odd element, and 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 Anna, what what you 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 sort of prompted me in sort of thinking about that. The what I love, you know, are the the references, you know, to 
climate, technology, you know, bringing those kind of elements into the show. But I think the best part for, of this, this episode for me is watching Wesley engage with children. You know, he is constantly only with adults. And for he, a whole other element of his personality and his 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 warmth and who he is 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 able to come through. You know, we talked a little bit about this in 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 the episode, but that's that's really um was it would have been so nice to have more of that in the series, you know, more of his experience with his peers. Mm -hmm. You know, we would have had a different um, um, relationship to Wesley Crusher. Crusher. Um, the other thing I'll leave you guys with is, um, speaking of the Okudas and Doug Drexler, I am going to um, be spending the evening with them tomorrow night. Oh, cool. Um, oh. At the, at the um, at the uh, California Science Center, where there is a tribute to, it's called Yuri's Night, and it celebrates Yuri Gagarin. And um, I will let them know that we talked about them both today and um, give a kind of nod to uh, Michael's incredible design in this particular episode. So um, it's gonna be a space party tomorrow night and uh lots of uh other folks from from trek and mm -hmm. lots of real the real deal tomorrow night the real science scientists and astronauts so um you know in honor of artemis 2 being announced this week and all kinds of cool stuff is happening so i will fill you guys in next time i see you awesome very good stuff any uh Anything to add to that, Ciroc Lofton? Um, you know, I, I thought that it was interesting that this uh, civilization decided to focus only on the arts. And I think that was one of the yeah. things that led to their downfall because they didn't. <laughs> Focus on science, mathematics, the same engineering, <laughs> it, only the arts. I mean, we love the arts. And, you know, as a, a person who's in the arts, I have a lot of respect for it. But I also believe that it, it can't be the sole basis for knowledge amongst a civilization. There has to be knowledge beyond um, woodworking, playing the music acting um things that are artistic endeavors it has to be some of it has to be based on actual sciences um mathematics and i think that was another one of the lessons in the storyline if, if i may say when the kid meets back with his father and he says you still have to take calculus you can be an artist but you still have to have an understanding of the basic sciences that govern the way we live. And um, without it, then you don't have architecture and you don't have all of the things that we need uh, foundationally to have a functioning society. So, yes, arts is important. Yes, it should be, um, you know, encouraged, but it can't be the only thing that one's identity is uh or their knowledge base is uh based off of mm -hmm. great stuff mr lofton i thought the same thing how they're going to figure out computers if all they're doing is playing music and building dolphins not that we love those <laughs> things but it's, it needs a balance uh well thanks everybody that was a lot of fun thank you to melissa Homer, Allison, Stephanie, Chris, my Tierney, Steve, Carrie, Matt, and Anna, and everybody at home, thank you very much. We will see you soon for myself, Denise Srock, and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg, and that hair wig ball thing. Uh, see you <laughs> next time. Tail. Yeah, with the tail. <laughs> Always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>